Hello, everyone, and welcome to the sharing group. Today's lesson of A Course in Miracles is lesson 78, which is so, I love, I love how the lessons go with the guests. Uh, lesson 78 is let miracles replace all grievances. Let miracles replace all grievances. And that is exactly what my guest has done, y'all. David Williamson had a near-death experience. And after experiencing his true essence without the body, he now creates his life and serves others as an impact. Uh, David, thank you so much for joining the sharing group. We are so excited to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I, I, at this point, it's kind of like what you just said, and I never even really articulated it that way. Just, just serving others. I, I love to listen to people uh, articulate what they are, what they see as problems. To me, is most of the time opportunities now because mm -hmm. of my perspective has changed. So I. I'm often able to help people reframe, you know, what they consider to be problems, because I think it is just goes like kind of what you said, just my whole life now is a gift. And I view everybody's life as a gift. So those little things that kind of get you, you know, thrown off kilter. So what? Focus on the opportunity. We can always figure this out, you know. <laughs> yes, we make it so yeah. much bigger than what it has to be, right? We make yeah. it so much bigger. Yeah. I so, did it my whole life. I did it my whole life, you know, until it frustrated me and until it started giving me damage, like damaging my body as a result of the frustrations that had come with turning, you know, small issues into these huge insurmountable obstacles and, and, and having your nervous system traumatized and engaged all the time trying to figure out stuff that you, you should just put on autopilot. You know, you just figure it out and put it on autopilot. You don't have to toil over all of this, you know. Yeah. Yes, I love that. I love, can't wait to hear. I cannot wait to hear about your process. So start with your NDE and then like, yeah, take us into how you process things differently after that. Okay. Um, I, leading up to my NDE, my personality was, I was just deeply just sad, depressed person. Um, it doesn't really, there was nothing that I could there was no ideation inside of me that was going to change my perspective. I just seemed to be kind of stuck in this negative um, space and really disappointed by circumstances for black people really, you know, impacted by that um, to the point where, um, like I said, just the depression, the anger, the um, a lot of negative ideation. It just led to my sickness. I had uh, digestive issues for years then hypertension, and then the heart attack. And um, but um, February first, two thousand seventeen, I, I had this. I felt the rip in my chest, and um, it was one of those super moons of the blue blood moon. And um, it just uh, energy was high. I mean, I felt my I felt my body kind of at a, in a high, high, high state, and like I knew it was something going on, you know but it affected my blood pressure too. And I could feel that as well, you know, and I was just sitting with some friends and I felt, it felt like a rip, but in my, in my, um, where I felt it, uh, it was in my back and in my shoulder. I never at any point felt anything localized to my heart. So I never thought I was having any kind of heart issue. Um, so, but I remember pausing and looking at my friend and I was like holding my, my chest and like like over in my shoulder area and I said dang this back pain just shifted gears you know <laughs> and then I and I paused for a minute and my eyes were like really wide because the pain was extreme and then uh and I sat for a minute and then I kind of like semi-integrated it in that moment you know and then I just continued the conversation but I was still kind of really impacted by the the, the pain that I was feeling in my back and shoulder okay then go to work the next day seven days passed I'm leaving work uh, and I'm just telling people goodbye. Uh, and I feel this sting in my chest as I'm stepping off a curve. And um, 
the guy was saying, I see you tomorrow, Mr. Williams. And I, you know, I'm waving at him and saying, I see you tomorrow, because there was nothing in my imagination that would make me think that that wasn't gonna happen, you know. <laughs> so uh <laughs> so I'm I'm, I'm gonna see you tomorrow. And uh so I get in my car after I feel that sting, and um, and it's like now it's it's it, it I don't like it's my heart is beating kind of weird. Um my breathing is starting to get infected. And so I pause a minute and it kind of eases up and I'm like, okay, I'm okay. And then, then it comes back and, you know, so I drive home. I wasn't, I called my son's mother first and just to, to talk to her about it, to see what she thought. And, um, and she was, you know, she was worried, but I was like, I think I can make it home. So I, uh, I went ahead and um, drove home and on the way it was kind of coming and going. My breath was losing my breath, getting it back. It was, I don't know. It was like, it was, it was getting worse, but it was, there would be moments where it would feel better. So I was still kind of thinking I, I might be all right. You know, it could be something that's going to pass. Um, I get home, I make a snack. Um, <laughs> I'm still kind of just feeling myself like, okay, is this, and then after the snack, I chill for a little while. I'm like, okay, now nah, this is not, this is not easing up at all. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I tell my son's mother I need to go to the emergency room. And, um, so we went, and on the way, I could feel my, I was just losing my breath a lot on the way to the emergency room. And um, and I had to take really deep breaths to kind of stay present. And um, so when I get there, I'm, 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 I feel all of this. I feel like I'm about to pass out. I feel like I'm, I can't keep my breath. And the guy's trying to tell me to fill out paperwork and stuff. And I'm in that immediately, I'm like, I can't fill out any paperwork. I, I, and I put my hands up and they're shaking and stuff. And I'm like, I can't even, you know, I can't. I can't do it. Like I, like um, I need to be seen. I'm having a heart attack, and I, and that's what I was telling him. And he still kind of was insistent, and I, I cussed him out really bad. You know, I, 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 I gave him the business, and um, and then they, as I was cussing him out, I could see people from the left coming with a gurney. You know, because he kind of got the point, and I think he, you know, maybe he's told him to come out, but. Um, but immediately once I got on the gurney, I was pretty much out. Like I remember, um. Uh, rolling to the left and the last thought that I had before I passed out was this is going to be some beautiful sleep you know and because that's all of like it my, the heart attack for me it just felt like um I was drowning you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. it just felt like I was drowning it, and I just was losing my breath it didn't feel like pain I didn't feel pain so when I was passing out it was like it wasn't like oh my god this is hurting me I it was just I took a deep breath and I, and I just closed my eyes and it was, and I said, this is going to be some beautiful sleep. And it was very peaceful. Me leaving was very peaceful. And I, and I'm somewhat think that how peacefully I died can contribute to how peacefully my, my experience was the whole transition into it. It was no trauma. There was no confusion at all. I, I literally, um, as they were pushing me, cause I passed out before they pushed me into the area where they would be trying to resuscitate me. Um, so once I get into that area, I'm I'm not seeing with my eyes. I'm seeing black. I'm seeing blackness. And where everybody is at, I'm seeing dots of light, like pixels, kind of like the stars in the background. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, and uh, but it's energy. Like I could feel it, and I could kind of hear conversation, but not really. Everything was like underwater initially, and then I was immediately kind of floating above myself, looking down at everything and at everybody and I could see where everybody was positioned before there were dots now there were people there I could see them um and then I could see a woman in the back of the room that she always that's this is somebody that I now view at I, I have to know who she is because I mean she was the the energy that made me kind of stay anchored to this planet so um my thought is that she was my aunt or just I mean, it could have been a hospital employee that wasn't involved with the resuscitation but she was in the back and she was holding her face with both of her hands and immediately i just wanted to to uh, tell her that i was okay and that she shouldn't feel bad about what was happening and i felt horrible that she was sad like she was really really sad and i did not want her to be sad that i was passing because i was not sad and, and everything i was feeling was so perfect and beautiful that I just wanted to tell her that. And it, and it kind of bothered me that I wasn't able to convey that to her. But in that space, it really truly felt like I would be able to learn how to do that. And that's what I I feel like that. Like, I feel like I could have figured it out and was would have been able to talk to her and tell her what was going on. So I was, I was really focused on that. And I think that if I'd have been gone long enough, she would have, some kind of interaction with her would have happened. You know, I really believe that because, um, 
I, I just feel like it's a matter of knowing, you know, I, you know, I didn't, I wasn't there long enough to figure it out, but I felt like I, I felt like I was learning while I was there, you know? And, um, but I looked at her, I wanted to talk to her. I watched them resuscitate me for a while. One of the doctors or one of the people in the emergency room that was resuscitating me was, was also affected by me dying. And I could feel and see that person stronger than everybody else, you know, as long along with the woman that was holding her face, those two people seemed to be the most deeply like they had compassion, like for me. And, and it made them louder. Their voice was louder. Their image was clearer than everybody else in the room, in the emergency room. Um, but I watched that and then I looked up at the ceiling and um, and immediately I was in space. There was no tunnel. There was no um, transition. It was just like I saw the ceiling and then I was in space. And um, and I initially, though, I was in a black, a very, very black space that felt like uh, I've heard other people say it. And that's the best way to describe it. The black was kind of enveloping me and it felt like velvet. Yeah. And but for me, it was like the blackness was it felt like love and it felt it was communicating um, some of the things I don't recall what the communication was, but there was you could, I could hear and feel communication with this dark, dark blackness. And um, um, it didn't feel threatening at all. It felt like love the same way that people describe light, you know? So when I came out of this blackness and I kind of looked down, that's what appeared to be the void. And, and I didn't recognize that transition until one other, you know, when I shared this story over and over and over, it's almost like it's vivid. It's like a screen in front of me that it's playing. And, and I'm seeing it again, but I didn't recognize that transition from that blackness to above the blackness until I described it in another interview, you know, but so I know that blackness that I was looking, that I was inside of appeared to be what I emerged from. And then when I was looking down, that was what people refer to as the void. And in that blackness was everything, like all, when I looked at that blackness, it seemed like all possibilities that existed in this life were there. Um, questions were answered instantly uh confusion tension anything that i had inside of myself that was a uh, like the, like any kind of idea of absence or lack or or confusion instantly was cleared up when i looked in the void um i felt like love everything around me felt like love um it was beautiful and i and and it Another part of that void, maybe because I once I got into space outside of that blackness, I didn't have um, a personal history. I didn't have um, a, a ego, but I had I was a reference point. Like I was a reference point, but it wasn't like um, it wasn't like the same as being David. It was just like I was. Um, I feel like all that I was was awareness or attention something very fundamental but not um organized in the, in the way that human identity is organized because i didn't have any kind of historical data to refer to when i witnessed something when i saw something it was like wow like a child it was like wow what is that and then instantly the distance between me and that thing would disappear and i would know what it was there would be no confusion after that at all it was instantaneous clarity instantaneous clarity from, with everything you know and um and that's how I moved through space was like looking at different things and like oh what is that wow and I would move to that and I would know what it is but I, I sat and I watched the star forming region for the bulk of my time in space because it was beautiful um the uh red pink white radiation it, like it, it started at red and it radiate radiated down into pink and shit and white I don't know if that's a word but it would uh it would fade down into from red to pink to white and then dark blue to light blue to white and then it would be white in some areas as well and it was just beautiful and I, and then I could see the stars faint inside of these clouds and the thought inside of me is that, so this is where stars are born you know, and I and I knew that like I knew that this is where the stars were being born. And um, so when I came back and I started Googling everything, <laughs> like I got to Google this stuff. I Googled where our stars formed and um, the pictures came exactly like the pictures that I was looking at star forming regions. You know, um, I, I, I saw an asteroid 
um, that I didn't know. I didn't call it an asteroid in space. In space, I knew what it was, but I didn't have words. It, there were no words that I needed to describe. I just was comfortable with my understanding of things when I was there. And um, but when I came back, I googled um, like what, like how. I think I just googled like rocks floating in space. How are they? How do you describe rocks floating in space? Because I didn't know whether to call it a meteor, or a meteor, you know, a, a, a asteroid, a comet. But this thing didn't wasn't it was floating. It was not moving fast. It didn't have a tail. It didn't have any of those other characteristics that would make me think it was something else. So I, when I googled it, it, it says that asteroids appear red in space and i think it had something to do with the direction if they were fl floating away from earth or towards earth it might influence the color or how they appear but this was red and based upon the definition that i saw it was just a rock it didn't have any life kind of emitting from it like the stars felt like love this rock kind of just felt like a rock you know mm -hmm. um um so i knew it was an asteroid and, and the same i mean like everything i could define so when i was trying to ground what the the void was um i just described it to myself and i and i like it was a black space that was blacker than space itself like space was was black and beautiful blackness but the void was much blacker than space and you could see it was almost like a a patch in space that was darker than space itself yeah and i and i and it seemed as though there were other of those spaces you know, if I looked around, there seemed like there were other those spaces, but um, where I could just see that, oh, that space is a little darker than the space around it, you know. And I think those were voids or black holes or however we want to discuss them. But I just think that outside of the body, experiencing those things, it's magical, it's beautiful, it's uh, it's clarity. It's um, it seemed to, and and once I was in it, it seemed to erase my human experience almost mm -hmm. like it seemed to yeah and then when i came out of it i was a, a orb of light and 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 i understood what was going on um in a really powerful way like i was one with everything around me um it just felt perfect i just it just felt perfect it was a beautiful opportunity to be in that space you know and the and to feel that feel that way you know, because it made me understand love differently. Love is a force. It's not just this emotion. It's a force that can make you stand upright. It can make you, it, it allows you to see what other people deserve from you, you mm. know, you know. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Um, thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing uh, that incredible experience. Um, the lady that you said that you felt kind of tethered you back to earth, um, I think that's very true. I think that was her. I don't even, you don't need, from my, what I'm understanding, you don't even know if she was really there, if anybody else saw her, right? I don't think so. I don't. I mean, because when I immediately opened my eyes, I, I I leaned to the left to try to find her, and I said, and I just blurted out the first words. Once I opened my eyes, I just blurted out, "Are you okay?" Yeah, <laughs> and, they, and they were looking at me like, "What in the world is wrong with him?" <laughs> and then there was a, the guy that I saw that was affected by him trying to. I asked him if he was okay, and they cut me off, and um, said, "I know. Are you okay? You know, did you didn't feel that?" And I said, feel what? And I looked down and I could see this pad on my chest, like some gel like pad. I guess they use it to um for the pet the defibrillator pads to go the, to go on to keep from burning you. I don't know. But um I saw the indention in the in that gel pad where the defibrillator pads had been because it was a, so I was looking at that and, and that's when I when they said you didn't feel that. And I was like, feel what? And then I looked down and I saw that in those indentions in that gel pad thing, and I said, Oh, I really was dead. You know, <laughs> in my mind, I like oh, I really was dead. You know, and and I still kind of looked over, and I didn't see that woman over there. So either she was not there at all, like a, a some kind of ancestor or or image from you know from my own you know attention and thoughts awareness, or she had moved, but I didn't see her. I, I don't even recall when I blurted out, "Are you okay?" I don't recall looking at her face and seeing any reaction at all. It just was. After I blurted out, are you okay? I kind of laid back and my energy was gone. Like I was tired. 
Oh. And another weird thing that I don't know if I've shared by, while being recorded or not, <laughs> but another weird thing that occurred once I laid back and and just was still kind of out of it from being, I guess, just being defibrillated and heart having stopped. You just kind of, I was just out of it. I looked to the left and there was a, a a young white guy that had a beard, like shaggy beard, like he needed to shave kind of. And he looked like Shaggy from um, Scooby-Doo. And he looked me right in my face like he was he was bent over to where his face I'm laying on my back, but his face was really like right next to my face. And, he's, and his eyes was big. And he said, what did you see? You know, <laughs> I love that. And, it, I and love in that it. moment, in that moment, I thought that was funny. I thought that was funny. So, and That's I didn't. Hilarious! I love that. I didn't have the energy to tell him anything, though. And I still wasn't certain what had happened to me. I thought I was, you know, dreaming or crazy. So I looked at him and I said, and I put my eyes just as big as his, and I said, blackness. <laughs> <laughs> and then I kind of faded out like I passed I remember just kind of going to sleep or just closing my eyes and kind of fading out but um I don't even know if he was a real person because it was just so weird how he was so close to my face and um and just like like you know it was just warm like I I didn't feel any kind of even though he was right there in my face I was like this is weird but what's up? You know, like, what do you have to say? <laughs> and he said, what did you see? It was just so hilarious how excited he said that. And I, and I just, my response was, was really humorous. I was trying to be funny. I just, bro, oh, I, blackness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. Cause if I were yeah. in the ER, that's what I would be asking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you see who did you yeah. see? Um, I love that because it's almost like it's becoming common knowledge. Yeah. Back in the day, if you came back from being dead in the hospital and you talked too much about what you saw, they the first thing, especially the doctors, would be talking about committing you. Yeah. Because I think a part of that, of course, is their ego. Mm -hmm. Not wanting to acknowledge that they lost the patient. So yeah. they don't want you to hear say anything about that. But I love that it's just becoming more common knowledge. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, the dear, that the dear. Yeah. that's hilarious. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, what's fascinating to me, David, is your love your love for this woman that you wanted her to not be stressed you wanted her to be okay and it's like that's what tethered you back here and yeah. I, I do believe she was there to kind of help I mean I'm ha I have another guest I'm about to um have on the show and she saw three spirit guides during her experience and one of the the two she could not see at all she could only hear but one of them looked exactly like her daughter mm. and she said that she believed that she looked like her daughter to kind of again tether her back to this yeah. planet because when you're in that dimension you don't want to come back no, I didn't want to come back. back here. Now, I didn't even remember being a human being when I was there. I didn't want to come back here. I wanted to travel space, and I was really enjoying traveling space. It was beautiful just traveling space. And um, but she looked like my aunt, uh, you know, my aunt Anne, which was my mom's twin sister. So she immediately was going to catch my attention because I think of my aunt uh, Anne fondly, like I love her, and I and her life was you know, pretty tur turbulent, you know, like, um, she has health issues, um, a lot of human being stuff, you know, a heartache and love and stuff like that. I've I watched her and, and I watched her resilience and her strength and her, you know, and she was just always strong to me, you know, is she he here? Has she transitioned? Transition. And okay. So my aunt, Anne, um, when I was in, the hospital, my aunt and her health had taken a turn. I think she was in um, like a um, kind of like a hospice type scenario. Like it's a center that, you know, kind of help people when they're, you know, really sick and they um, 
need more medical attention, you know? And, um, but she wasn't gone, but she had undoubtedly, cause she had had several heart attacks and, uh, she had undoubtedly had this experience. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that she was aware that I wasn't, you know, if I think she had an awareness of stuff that the average person didn't because of her near death experiences. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. certain she had some because yeah. toward the end of her life, like she had multiple heart attacks. So, um, but her presence is just, I'll never, I don't, she'll never leave me. Like she's part of me. Um, and, um, and I think that that's, why that image appeared that way or why she, if she intentionally did it that's who it was it was probably my aunt because mm-hmm. um it made me pause and it made me really 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 feel a connection and i and i wanted to 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 communicate that you know and i just remember the things that i remember about my aunt that make the me connect where is this this funny funny stuff mostly she, when she she was at home she was always comfortable and uh, she would cook sausage and eggs mixed together and, and nobody else really did that. You know, so, and then she would make these potatoes with onions and, you know, and it was just everything she cooked to me was just different and perfect, you know? <laughs> so I just love my aunt and, uh, and I don't even know if any, if I'd ever expressed how much I loved her, you know, when she was here, you know, but I know she knew. Um, but I want to make that clear that my aunt Ann is, was like a, a superhero to me. I've seen her and and I've seen and heard stories that I was even too young to, to know about, but about her, some of her antics in superheroics. But she, <laughs> you know, she's a movie could be made about my my mom and my aunt. You know, they uh they're, they're twins and they were both just amazing people, but very different. My mom was is um my aunt is fire. My mom would be like the cool, the air maybe, you know. But uh, but she would get she could get hot too you know but it would take a whole lot more but my aunt Anne was she was always ready you know and uh, and I think I just appreciate observing even just both of them the differences um, but the um, yeah I loved it I love my aunt. <laughs> I love that. I, that is so cool that is so yeah. cute I definitely it was like having a second mother because she was my mom's twin sister so I feel like that was her. I feel like yeah. I feel like that was her. That is so cool. So something else you said that I do not want to miss. Um, you said you felt like if you had been on the other side long enough, you could have learned how to communicate with her. And that is absolutely consistent with everything that I've read about in terms of On the other side, what we do as souls, we actually take class about classes about how to energetically communicate with our loved ones on this other side, whether it show up in their dreams. Uh, I've read about us being able as souls to direct energy to the person to make them think of us. Um, so when you said that, I'm like, yeah, that's, that's, that's actually, I mean, it's consistent from what I've read that you, you could have learned how to connect with her. Yeah. Yeah. I believe that. And it, and what it made me think about when I returned after, and I started pondering the idea of learning how to come back and move around how I want to throughout, um, this space and dimensions, you know, and materialize and dematerialize. Like I felt like I could do it all. Like I felt like I could come back here and participate if that's what I wanted to do. Like I got felt like everything was a possibility. And um I just felt like it was just a matter of me figuring it all out. And I in the same way that I fi- figured out, you know, the, the the same way that I am not connected to the ideas and the thoughts and ideology and identity stuff that um that kind of put me in a bad state and in an unhealthy state. Um, it's the same way now that I see how this works. Like it's the I know that I am influencing not only my life with my thoughts, but my afterlife with my thoughts, and I can also start influencing and determining and deciding what I want to do next if I come back here you know and I know that and I and so when I hear certain t- 
teachings about near death experiences, it becomes it, it kind of um, my experience was very um, it wasn't as dynamic as a lot of other people's experiences that I hear. Like I didn't see people, I didn't have any interaction with something else. I didn't. Um, I was the awareness that was in the space that was interacting with everything in the space. Um, there was no other awarenesses around me, but everything was aware, you know, everything was alive and was exuding this energy, this love. And, and, uh, so I felt like I was the same as everything around me. Um, it didn't lend itself to the idea of like classes and, but there could have just been, I was in that moment. I hadn't met any other awarenesses. I don't know. You know, I'm open to this, the possibility of everything, you know, but it seemed as though what I was going to do was to continue just to move around and figure this stuff out. You know, it, I didn't, and there was nothing in my awareness that desired anybody to teach me or to show me, or I feel like I, I would have, I would have known it if it was just time. A matter of time, I would have known how to do all of, all of that stuff. Because even when I kept coming back into the emergency room, like I would get closer to her, I would move away from her. I was it was like I was trying to test out ways to uh, communicate with her. And for me, and just the the way that I look at everything, that is that's a scientific approach. Like I was taking an approach even outside of my body to to test different ways to to try to work with her. You try to communicate with her, so. When I came back, I just it, it just was almost immediately clear to me that, oh, I would have figured that out. Like, I would have figured that out. Like, that wouldn't have been nothing. And it makes me think about Paramahansa Yogananda and how, in his autobiography of a yogi. He talks about the teachers coming and going in the orbs. Well, I was an orb. I was an orb, right? So if I would have came back and materialized here uh, strongly enough to where someone could see me, the human brain would have probably put my image in the middle of that energy and that, of that orb because that's the frequency that I, you know, was when I was here, right? Mm -hmm. Same as way as described in those books is like, it all makes sense to me now. Like I probably could have appeared to people who love me deeply enough as an orb of light with an image of David in the middle, you know? Um, I think all of that stuff's possible, but it would have just been, a, it's just a matter of me figuring it out, being there long enough to figure it out, you know? And and believing now, like setting myself up now in a way to where nothing that I believe now prevents me from having that as a possibility that if I tell myself that all heaven is is streets of gold and I'm going to get to play with the lions, the tigers and the bears and it's all going to be perfect. And, you know, the streets are going to be lined with jewels and wall, you know, all of these things, these images that we're given, you know, if we take that literally, then we reduce our possibilities to something very specific and and I think that's why we have a lot of uniformity in these experiences, because a lot of people think the same ways and are taught the same ways and are, and are really, literally given an idea of what heaven is and should be. And so a lot of people go and they have uniform experiences because we have a lot of uniform beliefs, you know, here on this planet, especially now, considering that, uh, you know, there's only four or five companies that own all of the media <laughs> and people are thinking about and talking about much of the same stuff all over the world these days. And, and it's not spiritual. I mean, I've had, I've worked in, in, um, for larger companies that have huge populations of people from different countries, countries to the point where we celebrate their holidays at work. You know, um, uh, I used to get laughed at by young Indians, uh, people because I carried around Hindu texts all the time. And they were laughing. Like, my parents read these books. Why are you reading them? You know, <laughs> like younger Hindus. It's a younger Indians. We're not as into that as our parents were. And and uh, and I would just tell them, you know, you probably need to talk to your parents, you know, so that you can, you know, see the value in this. And and because if you are, if you, the quality of your life is good, I can guarantee you it is because your parents thought in a certain way, you know, that came from these teachings. You know, um, so I would I can guarantee you it'll help you, you know, and that's what all I would say to them. I was like, these texts help me in my life before my near death experience. And they help me way more after my near death experience, because Hindu Vedic texts, the even um, they all talk about awareness and consciousness and 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 
And it's just been helpful. It's been helpful because that's all that I felt like I was when I was out of the body and all of the teachings now before they didn't, they didn't sink in the way that they do now. Now, when I read these, these texts, it's like, it's from the perspective of awareness. It's from the perspective of consciousness. It's not from the perspective of a human being trying to figure out awareness and consciousness, you know, mm -hmm. because that's difficult. I spent a long time trying to understand that and it's hard, you know? So once you, whatever happens, happens, you get that perspective. You get that, I call it the fourth attention. And that's what I'm going to write about that um, soon because it's, it's something that everybody has access to because that's what we are. We are the fourth attention. The other attentions are, uh, uh, they're in the body. You know, they're, they're, they're um, the first three attentions are the body, the mind, and the ideas and thoughts that the body mind holds and, and, and um, puts in our awareness to experience, you know. But the fourth attention can assess all of that. The fourth mm -hmm. attention can look at that, appraise it, see what has worked, what hasn't been working, and, and drop these ideas, change your personality, change your ideology, change your orientation towards identity and all of that. And that's what's happening with me with my fourth attention is that it's it's allowing me to see what parts of my experience were good, good experiences that, you know, don't affect my energy so much. They just are what they are. And the parts of this experience that transformed me into something less than perfect because it, it made me deem um, that some kind of change was necessary, that some kind of ideological energetic shift was necessary. And it's usually trauma or confusion or, or a, a very incongruent thought being presented to you as if it's the, as if it's a conclusion or the absolute truth and you don't understand that idea. So you end up shifting something in yourself to try to understand that idea or to integrate that idea. I have to, I've thought through so much of my life now and tried to reintegrate like the understanding that I had before I chose to try to understand life in very specific systematic ways so that I can become something. You, know, you gotta, you gotta be something when you grow up. So you gotta center some, some repository of knowledge as if that's some, as if that's the truth. Like I had to, I went to business school, you know, I went, uh, so now, now I'm, a, I have a business degree that I went to school for IT stuff and, I, and I'm an IT guy. So it's like the, the more you learn here, it's like the more you kind of funnel yourself into a specific mode of action. But if you take that thing to be your identity, then you've totally reduced your opportunities here because now I'm just an IT guy, you know, yeah. you know, and that's a very limited experience. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, but we're not these things. We're not these titles. We're not these identities. We're not these bodies. We're not any of this stuff. We're these vast re repositories of information and energy that come here and ride these bodies, you know, to have, to have this experience. And when you identify yourself as that, everything here becomes an opportunity. It becomes magical because you, you're not hurt by it. You know that, you know that you're not hurt by it. So you don't, you're not threatened. Your nervous system isn't engaged as much because it's just, it's fun. It's fun. The worst thing that can happen is you die. And that was the best thing that ever happened to me in this life. So there's no more concern about how to, this what decision to make or how to move here. It's just, let's move, let's do something. You know, the worst thing that can happen has already happened. And I'm not really concerned about that. So let's do something, you know. I love that. Um, yeah, I want you to go a little bit into that, how when you were out of the body, right, you kind of release all of the identity uh, focus you had, uh, yeah. release the stress, the anger. Um, tell us about Tell us about that. When I was looking down at my body, you know, and I may not have said this, but I the words that came because I said his body is dead, his mind is dead, his ego is dead. That that literally was related to me. Like I knew that and I understood that and I heard that. And um, so the next kind of logical thing for, within me was like, well, then what remains? Like, what's what am I now? You know, and then the words that flooded into me were like attention, awareness, soul, spirit, energy, light. And um, and then, you know, I was aware that I was dead. I, I said, you used to be there. Um, and then a, another phrase that kind of came 
to me, awareness that came to me is that your personality killed you, you know? Um, and I knew that. And then, wow. so coming back into this life, it was, it just immediately shifted my perspective of what had been happening to me from uh, the evil white man did it, you know, because of racism. Cause I, I experienced a lot of racist stuff that made me accept all of the racial narratives and, um, and now I don't, but, um, it made a shift from, from that to what energy and ideology and emotion and thoughts did you carry into these situations that you, and you didn't get the outcome that you want. And, and you, instead of saying, instead of being aware of the thoughts, the energy, ideology, all that stuff that you carried into that situation, you just simply blamed the external, the external, you know, the other person. Oh, they're racist. That's why they didn't say yes to what I would have wanted to happen from that, you know, scenario. Um, instead of saying that, no, you, I've influenced a lot of my outcomes with my own personality, with my own thoughts, with my own negativity, with my own feelings of worthlessness with my own feelings of I don't deserve this with my own like I am in the way and, and once I realized that I was in the way there was no external variable that I could ever blame anymore wow. um, yeah and and the the thing that gets you in the way is your attachment to all of the words that you use to just define yourself uh, if I am an activist if I'm a black man and I'm a proud strong black man it is certain things I'm just not going to allow myself to do, you know, mm -hmm. and and then if I was affected by racism negatively and now I have a disposition of, of anger, you know, and resentment, then there's just certain things that I'm probably going to be more more um, prone to do. And and that's coming into situations where, there's you know, white people may be there and having a nervous system response because I have all this ideology and this 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 uh, negative energy inside of me. Um, respond related to a story that I've been told my whole life about how black and white people have, have historically got along and how we're supposed to get along now. And these narratives aren't true. Mm. They're not true. I mean, you can go back to the highest civilizations in the history of this planet and they cooperated. Mm. The Greeks and the Egyptians cooperated. And you and if you don't think that's true, you can look at how the ancient the ancient Greek philosophers wrote about the Egyptians. And they talked about what they learned. They talked about how they work together. So, so now we go into this Alexander the Great thing and we say, well, Greeks conquered Egypt. No, they did not. You know, that's not my perspective anymore because Egypt had been conquered multiple times, had been had outside incursions multiple times before Greece came into the equation. Why did Greece come into the equation? Greek had, Greece had Ptolemies and, and um, Egypt had pharaohs. These were divine rulers in their mind. These are high, high, much more highly evolved people than just a regular human being. And they let these were the people that they allowed to rule society and to, to govern and inspire people in society. Um, when the Egyptians were stopped from practicing their, their traditions, when the pharaoh system got disrupted by outsiders taking control of, of Egypt, that's when Alexander came down into to Egypt. And that's my opinion, you know, and it was to restore divine kings, kings as the rulers of Egypt. If the pharaohs had been disrupted, then we needed Ptolemies now because this, we're doing the same thing. And so they, the Ptolemaic period began in in Egypt. But inside of Egypt, they weren't fighting the Ptolemies. They weren't. They didn't hate the Ptolemies because the Ptolemies were from Greece and Greece and Egypt had been working together for a long time doing some of the same things. But when these outsiders came and they start destroying temples and start disallowing the Egyptians to practice what they had been practicing, that's when there was tension. And you can read this, this is history. This is not something that I'm making up. Now, I could be distilling some of my positions from what I'm reading and coming up with my opinion of it, but it seems to hold true when you look at the historical record. The Greeks didn't think negatively of the Egyptians. The Egyptians didn't, I don't read things to say that they they thought negatively of the Greeks. You know, I haven't seen a lot of that. Um, but we seem to transpose the Southern racial narrative on ancient Greece and Egypt, and it ain't there. 
it just ain't there the same way. <laughs> and so this new racial narrative and dynamic that we deal with is new. So this this whole narrative of white and black was invented. There's different blacks. There's different groups of black people on the planet. There's different groups of white people on the planet. There is no white and black. That narrative was invented to keep us stuck on stupid forever when in ancient times, a lot of different groups of white people and a lot of different groups of black people worked together to try to figure out what was happening here. Yeah, and we and 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 that's what we're working toward now, because yeah. all of that keeps us in a low vibration. Yes, that is the ultimate goal is to yeah. be so, up in a low vibration. Yeah, and the, the the simple way of looking at it is that as long as you have some kind of anxiety when you see somebody else that doesn't look like you. Your nervous system is immediately impacted. You you're not going to function at your at the highest at your highest. Mm -hmm. Now, and if even us, if we believe that these people are responsible for all of these atrocities, which I mean, the historical record kind of says that is some of it is true, and it, it but it doesn't justify you hating something or carrying hate inside of yourself so strongly that you kill yourself. One of the things that's powerful about uh, you, David, is when you talked about recognize, and it's very powerful, recognizing that your personality led to your death uh, and then making a decision that you're going to change your personality. That's powerful. Now, I'm, I'm going to say, uh, say a couple of reasons why. A lot of people believe the month of which they were born, the first seven years of their life, you know, all these different factors factor into their personality. And because of that, their personality is a fixed yeah. uh, phenomenon. But I love, love, love how you talked about, you changed, you made an intentional decision to change your personality because you recognized is it was the personality that led to you to your death. So can you talk about what are some of the ways that you did that? Like, how how yeah. did you go about doing that? Yeah. Um, and I think this is, it happens to me now almost every day. Like, I can, once I stop valuing ideology and identity stuff, it's almost like there's no, there's a lot of room inside of me. There's a lot of bandwidth that's freed up, that ain't processing and considering all of those things all the time. Um, so when I go into a situation now, I can let the energy of that moment fill me up because it's I'm not already filled up with expectation and ideology and identity and foolishness. You know, I don't have any outcome desired. I have a desired outcome, but I don't have any ideology or identity that I can compromise in that process. You know what I'm saying? There's, I don't have to be David. When I go into this, I can be what this situation calls me to be. This person over here is smiling. I'm just going to smile with them. And, you know, I'm, because they, you know, I can feel them so much clearly now without all of the identity and all of the other stuff inside of me that I can really just mirror them and take a walk with them, talk about everything other than what I want. And still at the end of the conversation, we're going to come to a conclusion that's beneficial to both of us, you know, and for me, it's just um, not coming into the scenario with a lot of ideology and identity and bull, you know, just my own personal nonsense. Like if I can suspend that, if I'm not good at suspending it always, at least suspend it in the moments where there's another person involved, when there's a desired outcome that I want, you know, that's how you entertain to me other personalities and other aspects of yourself is by suspending any attachment to what you've already done before. So that you don't feel like what you've done before is all that you can do. You know, before all I was was David. David was serious. David was a pretty angry person. David wanted to be taken seriously. So in any interaction, even with a jovial, goofy person, I was still going to be like. And how do you expect to get a good outcome from a person that's jovial and you're just stone facing them the whole time? You, that's not showing any awareness to what's happening around me, but that's showing a complete commitment to the identity that I have chosen. All right. Now you choose your identity, you choose your, it's like choose your own adventure. You choose your identity, mm -hmm. you've, chosen, you've already chosen your own adventure, especially if your identity is so rigid that it ain't going to change. Your whole life has been chosen once you choose the identity rigidly. 
And it's predictable. That's when I think that's what I think about destiny and stuff like that. Once you define yourself rigidly, yeah, I know what your future is. It's easy. <laughs> it's easy. This is what happens to angry black men. We we have hypertension and we have heart attacks. This is what happens to anybody who's angry about their circumstances versus looking towards opportunities and trying to fix things and idea and having ideas about better, you know, having hope. You get sick. When you lose hope, you get sick. When you lose hope, you entertain ideologies that are nonsensical, that 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 reinforce that reinforce your 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 sickness. And then you will go out of here with that same ideology. They're, they're stubborn old men who on their deathbed still are talking crazy. I've seen it. <laughs> you know, know. You know, some people leave here with the same ideology that they, but I think that the the, the death process is is what presents us oftentimes. Um, the uh, the opportunity to drop it. I mean, I think dementia, Alzheimer's, all of these things are opportunities for us to drop an attachment with identity. And I, yeah. you know, you, yeah. if you don't want to forget it, we go. The body gonna make you forget it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know. Yeah. So if, even if you look at that that way, it becomes a thing where even those types of afflictions aren't horrible. Because why do they need these memories when they leave here? I didn't remember being a human being outside of my body. So watching somebody lose their memories in this life is almost like, oh, shoot, you're lucky. You're going to leave here with no attachment to this experience because you've forgotten it all. You don't even, you know, you don't even have a clear identity anymore inside of those. It's once you get deep, deep, deep into those mental, you know, those neurological degenerative, you know, illnesses. Mm -hmm. um, and for all intents and purposes, that's where I'm at. I don't have an attachment to my identity. So I just remember, I do remember being David. I do remember going through these things so I can talk about them, but it's still, it's like talking about it in third person. David was an idiot and David let his idiotic beliefs kill him. And now I ain't going to do that. You know, me and David going to work better together now because I have this fourth perspective that isn't defined by what happens here. It isn't defined by David's body and his experiences and his, his trauma it is infinite. It left here. It saw space. It saw love in a total different way. It experienced what being uh, awareness is outside of just being in the body. So the body isn't the foundation anymore of everything for me. It's a expression of mm. what I actually am, you know. I, all that, all of that. Yeah. I love, you said some profound stuff. Um you say some profound stuff. Uh, I love what you're talking about in terms of releasing those those identities. And it really honestly reminds me, David, of something that you said when you were out of the body. Everything was right now. Yeah. You were just like... <gasps> oh, look at that, and look at this. And you didn't have all that baggage, that garbage, those titles, you know, uh, the, the, the plight of a group of people, none of that you had. You marveled at the present moment. And I would like to highlight that because that's really what we should all be doing. Yes. Singing right now. Don't regard people as a certain color. Don't regard people from terms of the past. Stop bringing the past to the present moment. There's a, a quote in the Course in Miracles that says, don't bring the past to contaminate the present moment. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, that, that's what it does. That's right? it. Yeah. That's what it does. It contaminates right now. And I love, love, love. I just love that. And, and people are going to benefit from your experience because you have experienced the lower parts of, yeah. of identity, right? And, it, yeah. and like you said, it killed you. But I, I love your sense of personal responsibility. I do. Um, and acknowledging how you created an experience and 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 having the courage to create something different that is that's beautiful thank that's you beautiful. thank yeah. you you know i wanted to refer back to the a course in miracles you said number 78 could you articulate what the um the lesson is again because i had something i wanted to say to that absolutely uh number 78 
which when I, okay, if you've seen enough of my videos, you see that I don't, I don't, I don't look at the next lesson and then choose the, the next guest. I, I schedule my guests and then I say, okay, God, what lesson you have for this guest? And like clockwork, it fits that guest. And so when I read it, it states, let miracles replace all grievances. Yeah. And that's exactly right. I yeah, love it. Perfect. Because I couldn't see, and I and this is my status on Facebook right now. It's like I couldn't see beauty here until I started seeing beauty here. You know, mm. I didn't have hope in, in any aspect of this human experience until I started having hope. And now hope is my default, you know, it's it's my compass, you know. And um, so to me now is like everything. Uh, the more I feel and see what I want from this experience, like I watch magic happen around me every day. People call out of the blue and say, hey. And I'm like, wait a minute, I was just thinking about this yesterday. You know? And it's just every moment is magical. So it's like uh, all of the things that that made me miserable still exist. Race, racial narrative still exists. Racial, bad racial politics still exists. There are still ways that I could justify all kinds of racial nonsense. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But it's just not in my attention right now. Like my attention is focused on the things that I would like to see. It's focused on, uh, to me, hope and God are almost synonymous because without mm -hmm. hope, you would do anything. You know what I'm saying? You know, you'll believe anything. You'll, you can hurt people. But when you have hope and, and you look at everything through a lens of hope, you just see everything in its most perfected and profound state. Like I look at everybody and I, and I imagine them actualized because I have a hope that they will be, you know, and, um, and, and the way that they will view this reality after they become that, after they figure it out, um, none of their negative qualities are going to ever even be there anymore. So it's like, I don't have to even entertain their negative qualities now. It's just uh, your nervous system is affected in this way because you've experienced X, Y, and Z. But I have hope that you will resolve that and you will be operating back at your default, which is perfection, is enlightenment. It's uh, complete awareness and, and accountability for what's happening here. You know your energy, you know your thoughts, and you don't impose them on people mm -hmm. accidentally even. I'm not going to go into a situation and have a negative outcome and not consider how I affected that with my thoughts and the energy that I brought. It's me too. I'm there too. And, and I can't blame other people for everything anymore. I, you know? I love, like, I'm like, all my teeth are showing. I love, yeah. I love that. I'll, I'll tell you, I love, this is yeah. so juicy. So real quick, real quick, I wanted to, um, first of all, real quick, if we could be brief, do you think that your NDE was, do you think that, okay, pre-birth planning, do you think that your NDE may have been planned before you were born, that if you didn't get it by a certain point in your life, that you would have this opportunity to cross over and experience yourself outside of the body? Uh, yeah. Have you thought about that? I do think about it. And the way that I think about it is I created this life in my previous life and perhaps some of the afterlife experiences that I had after the, the previous life, you know, and the, and I'm creating my next life now. Mm. And, 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 and whatever I do in my, when I leave this body this time, it'll influence what I'll do next time as well. Nice. Yeah. But I don't think that I don't, I haven't been able to find a way to integrate the the idea of soul contracts inside of me. And that doesn't mean that they don't exist because I think everything exists. Everything's possible, right? If somebody believes deeply that soul contracts exist, then they're going to probably have some clarity about what they agreed upon in their next experience. And it'll play out in a way that shows them that they agreed upon it. But if I don't accept that as an, as an, as a possibility, then I will just experience reality in the way that I, I think I experienced it when I left here, you know, it was pretty much everything was you become what your attention makes you become period. You know, I mean, and I, yeah. Not okay. So real quick, real quick. In my intro, I talked about you being an empath, 
and you helping others. Can you articulate? Can you talk about uh, your your interactions with other people now that you've had this profound experience, how it's shaped your interactions with other people and how you help others? Yeah. Before, I didn't know what I was feeling. I was feeling, I could be feeling good one moment and then the next moment I'm angry and I didn't understand that that could be, that was just my sensitivity to everything around me. I viewed being an empath before as as torturous. It was, uh, it was a burden. I didn't want it. I didn't understand it, you know, but after the near-death experience, that annoyance and torture was amplified because now I was feeling everything even more and um, louder more confusing and um but i wasn't as i would say my nervous system wasn't uh, triggered the same way but the information was louder you know so it, it was more annoying but it was less triggering i guess and and, and i found out afterwards that um sometimes your brain the amygdala in the brain is changed after people have near death experiences you know and that's the part that tells the stories, the flight of flight, the, you know, and uh, so, I, and it feels, it feels, it's emotion, it's all of that energy, to, it interprets your reality around you and tells you what you should do in order to protect yourself or to get more of the good stuff that you that's there for you, you know. So, it seems as though that part of my brain isn't as functional. I'm not triggered as much from hearing anything from anybody. Um, I don't have any attachment to ideology and, and, um, and identity. So when people come to me, the, the empathy now, um, it's different because I, it's almost like I just let them pour into me and I become them for a moment so that I can feel what they feel. And in my nervous system even will feel it. But it's not my thoughts, it's their thoughts. So I have to, I can't allow that to go for long because I have hypertension sometimes. <laughs> and other people pretty much seem to have hypertension, you know. And so even though I don't really walk around with the numbers that I used to walk around with anymore, when I allow somebody's anxiety and their own internal angst to, to fill me up, my heart rate speeds up, you know, I, I feel their, I feel their confusion. I feel their anxiety the same way I felt it when I was uh, triggered in the same ways. So it allows me to feel them and to, but at the same time, I'm not clouded by those thoughts, but I feel what they're, how those thoughts are affecting them. So I can talk about the, what they are experiencing the same way that they're experiencing it. So then it made the empathy way more it's a process it's a it's a real action it's not just a i'm an empath no there's some there's a discipline that almost goes with it there's an awareness of that your thoughts can can make you ineffective at being an empath you know Mm -hmm. so if if you are an empath but you are rigid and you are judging you probably ain't gonna be a good empath you're just Mm -hmm. gonna tell people what they're supposed to do all the time you're just gonna tell people how to think you're gonna tell people you know that's not empathy. That's ideology. That's rigidity. That's you're hurting people more than you're helping people because everybody's life and experience dictates a different path, not some clarity that you think you have that is supposed to just be spread generically to every human being that you encounter. That's not helping people. That's spreading ideology. So when you dump yourself of ideology and you let the person's presence fill you up, you give them a message that's for them. You know, I love that. I love that. Um, if um if people want to reach out to you, David, uh, to chat about something you've talked about, are you open to that? And if so, what ways um can you be reached? Yeah, I'm I'm working on all this web stuff. Is all this stuff is shocking me? I didn't think I would ever be this interesting to people. <laughs> <laughs> you you talking to somebody who felt invisible? You know, I felt invisible. I felt like nothing that I was mattered to this place, you know? So, so that it's a, this is overwhelming sometimes, but I'm definitely open. Um, I, I need to change my Instagram because it's this really long, crazy word that I have to spell that people have to find. And 
but it's pneumatology.io on Instagram. Facebook is David Williamson. You can um the uh the URL you know, Facebook.com slash uh DVD 731, I think is uh and I can I'll send you all of these things too so you can post it with the video. But um and email is david.williamson7 at gmail.com, all of that. And, but I'm open. And most of the time when people reach out and they say something like profound or whatever, I just want to talk to them. So, <laughs> so, so I, I don't know. I'm just I'm just open right now. And so feel free to reach out. I'm open to, to, to any kind of conversation about spiritual stuff because that's really my focus in this life, you know? So I, I would definitely have that information. Um, I usually make it very easy for people to, to, to get in touch with my guests. So I'll have it both on the screen and I will have it in the description box. So don't worry about the long. Okay. Words. All right. <laughs> um, any last words, David, before we close out and I read you your closing remarks? Um, I, and just be try to start being present like always and um don't bring don't bring bias and ideology into into interactions with people and you will be amazed at how beautiful you will see everybody like i, I don't I, everybody's beautiful to me now like i because i don't care about the perspectives that i learned in this life and i care about the moment that I'm in is, and it seems like every moment now is just a beautiful moment. And I don't have to filter my reality through a bunch of toxic lenses and biases. Yeah. And, you know, now nah, everything is just beautiful and, and I let it play out how it will. And, and even if it's not so good, if my nervous system isn't engaged, I don't even have the capacity to tell myself a negative story about what happened. It just happened. It's just zeros and ones information. That's all this is. And our brain and our nervous system tells us uh, tells us otherwise. Our, our identity, our conditioning, uh, ideologies and stuff, biases, that tells us everything else. But what happens here is just stuff that just happens. <laughs> Energy moves, interactions occur. And then we tell these vast stories about everything else. And and, and, it, and most of that is lies, is what I'm learning, you know? <laughs> I so love just, that. Yeah, being the present. Yeah. Being in the present. <laughs> yes. Being yeah present moment i love that i love yeah. it. well this has been man this has been it's 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 beautiful it's been a beautiful conversation yeah. it really has um a lot of wisdom a lot of wisdom coming out of you and i can't wait you know you are welcome to join us again after you've written the book yeah. david um we uh we would love to to have you join us again and, and celebrate that. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to read your, uh, your closing remarks, sir. Okay. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on. So David, it is not only your near death experience that is inspiring. It is what you have done with that experience that holds the impact you exude. Your decision to throw away the limiting narratives that you were once exposed to are a demonstration of the power that we all are made of. Your near death and subsequent reset are symbolic of the rich opportunity that we all have at our fingertips, literally at our fingertips, to create a new in every moment of now, right now. It is a reminder that we, we are, in fact, the creators of our experience and that by simply being intentional with our thoughts, with our speech, with our actions, we are able to manifest a happy dream while we carry these bodies here in this illusion. I am so happy for you, my friend, that, you, you, so continue, that you continue to carry the beauty 
and the love that you are and therefore experienced it while you were out of your body. It is, it is not only the NDE itself that holds the power of a new life. If we don't do anything with it, then nothing changes. But yeah. it, it's within every decision to live in the present moment that enables our love and our light to shine through. And that is what you have done, David. You have used that experience, that event, as a catalyst to live, change life. So thank you for being here with us. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your courage to be different than those around you. Thank you for being here on this planet with us. And last but certainly not least, thank you for your love that you have shared with us today. It has been an absolute pleasure. It really has. Yeah. You got me about to cry, man. You... <laughs> but no, thank you so much. And I really appreciate those remarks because it's a pretty good summary of what I'm going through and what I've been through is trying to integrate an experience that is was larger than my entire life, you know, and, and trying to integrate it back into this little life, you know, and 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 this is what it looks like to me. It's just um I cannot ever reduce myself to what I had reduced myself to before. Will never do that again. I love myself now and I love soul. I love energy. I love what I am. I love awareness too much to ignore it, even though it's inside of this body, you know. So. Yes, you are not invisible, sir. Yeah. You are very <laughs> visible and we benefit from from your experience. And even as you move through that experience and shape and integrate it into your life um, and come up with the books that you're going to write, we, yeah. we benefit from that. So keep going, keep going. We applaud yeah. you. We really Thank you so much. And, um, yeah. and, and we end with a heart, David. You got yeah. it. For us. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Yeah, get it thank up. Thank you for joining <laughs> us. And thank you, everyone who has joined us with this conversation. I, I hope that you've enjoyed it as much as as much as I have. And um until next time, y'all. Love y'all. Love you. Love you all. Love you. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye.